Coming up, a proton launch and failure. SpaceX gets certified. And Brightman steps down. And then I'll have an interview with Chris and Jesse of the Space Up Foundation talking about their upcoming Kickstarter campaign as well as how you can create a Kickstarter campaign for something spacey awesome. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to Tomorrow, episode 8.16 for Saturday, May 16th, 2015. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'll be your host for this episode. Now, before we get started, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $10 to this episode. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. And if you want to help out the show, you can find out more information on our crowdfunding campaign over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, speaking of crowdfunding, Kickstarter is a great way to get your program off the ground, and we are bringing, bringing back the CEO of the Space Up Foundation, Chris Radcliffe, and the COO, Jesse Clark. Guys, welcome to Tomorrow. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what are you guys working on on Kickstarter right now? Absolutely. So what we're working on right now is a way to kick off the very first space ups that are being um, uh, backed by the Space Up Foundation. And uh, we're going to do five in 25 to 15. So I figured we'd make that the sci five project. So what what is this going to do? So you're, you're kickstarting some space ups, but we've already had space ups. Um, for people interested in what space up is, we have a previous episode. You can we'll put that in the show notes. But what is this Kickstarter actually going to accomplish for people? Good question. Good question. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the two basic things that uh, we need to provide to Space Ups from the Foundation are uh, nonprofit support. So basically, the Foundation itself is a nonprofit organization. And so um, Space Ups that want to be at uh, museums, libraries, other uh, venues that really need to work with nonprofits. Um, they can do that now because they can be projects of the, the foundation. In addition, there's, there's a little bit of startup money. Uh, it, it's kind of the chicken and the egg problem where uh, the venue needs a deposit before they'll um, give you the date. And until you have the date in the venue, you can't sell tickets. And so you don't have any money. And so it, it's just this little bit of, of startup money. And so for five space ups, what we're going to do is provide the startup money. It's in an account. The account's associated with the nonprofit, and they're ready to go. Generally, with the Kickstarter campaign, there are rewards at certain levels. So I contribute ten dollars, I get something back. What are some of those rewards? I'm I'm helping create these space ups. They're getting some money to get get their program off the ground. What do I get in return? It's so, it sounds yeah. so selfish when I say, like, what do I get out of this? <laughs> What's in it for me? <laughs> kind of. Well, I mean, a lot of people on Kickstarter, that's what they're going to they're gonna look at that, right? They're going to be like, I'm not just give you money. I want something in return. Right. And that's actually why we're doing it through Kickstarter, not just uh, taking donations. Yeah. So actually, in 2016, we're going to get donations in, in other ways. But the, the Kickstarter really comes down to this is your space up. It's always going to be your space up. So all five of these you're going to choose where they, they go. And so the very first reward that you get is a vote, a vote uh, in to, to decide where each of the, the five space ups are going to be. And you'll have a choice of space ups that all are ready to go in terms of the organizing teams. But then you choose. Do you want it to be Los Angeles or Anchorage? Do you want it to be Tuscaloosa or Buffalo? So that's, that's the first big one. Um, and of course, it's, you know, you're voting on the space up that you get. So it's directly connected. We'll talk about why that's important later. And then the other big thing that you get is our thanks and a special kind of thanks. So again, sci five. And so I had this idea that we would actually thank you direct or we wouldn't. Yes, we would thank you. You don't thank us. I'm confused. <laughs> well, which, I mean, you, you, you're getting money, so that's kind of a thank you, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. But what we do is, is we're going to thank you uh, directly. And so at, you know, at the, the smaller levels, you get a video that thanks everybody. But then um, if you put in $25 or more, I'm going to send you a video and I'm going to say, hey, you know, 
person. Thanks. Sci fi. <laughs> exactly. Which, you know, it's it's a worth a little bit. And then at the higher levels, we actually have some famous people who are thanking you. <laughs> people like Ben and Carrie Ann. Mm -hmm. You can get a thanks from them or from Leo Camacho or uh, 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 Dave Mastin. That kind of that kind of person. That would actually be very cool. I would like a sci fi from Dave Mastin. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there's. Sometimes when you do a Kickstarter, there's kind of the, you'll get a t-shirt. And we didn't really want that to be the focus of this one. But uh, quite honestly, if we raise enough money, each of the space ups are going to have stickers and patches and t-shirts as swag for the, the, the participants. And which reminds me, I, f I forgot about another one. So I'm, gonna I'm just going to jump right into that one. You get to go to the space up. Yes, I forgot the, right. the, the biggest, most important thing. If the space up happens, you get to go to it. $25 or more. So at $25 or more, you get... A space up. A ticket. You get a ticket. You go. And, which is actually quite a bit less than they usually cost to, uh, to walk in the door. And so that's the big thing. But then if we raise enough to actually make swag for all the people who go, including you, because you get that, then we're going to start making stuff for those space ups. I mean, we, we, we try to do that as often as possible. Do you have a t-shirt? Oh, yeah. well, you're wearing a t-shirt. Right. What am I? Yeah, look at that. Space up, Paris. And so when we start making those things for the space ups themselves, we will um, send them out to the, the backers as well. And so we call those uh, swag factors. Swag factor one, <laughs> swag factor two, that kind of thing. Engage swag factor. That's kind of what that feels like. Uh, <laughs> Is this so? You've got this campaign. Uh, I assume you'll be funded because you're only. You're, it's it's sci-fi, right? So uh, it was supposed to launch on five fifteen fifteen, uh, and you're raising five thousand five hundred and fifty-five dollars. Uh, yeah. That's a recurring theme throughout the entire project. Uh, so I assume you'll be funded because it's a pretty low amount, and everyone in the space community is fairly uh, tightly knit. And I, I have very little doubt you'll actually be funded and hit some of your uh, swag factor goals. Uh, but then after that. What happens? So let's say we go six months from now, these these space ups have already happened, but you still have the need for funding some of these space ups. Are you going to run more Kickstarter campaigns? Is there another project there? What, what's going to happen to actually continually flow money into space ups? Yeah, so actually I'll let Jesse handle that one <laughs> because uh, we're, we're doing this to stay and the, uh, the foundation is being built up. This is kickstarting it, not kickstarting and ending it. So... So part of what I'll be doing after we get kickstarted is to start uh, to go out to the companies and ask them to make donations that would then go towards a number of space ups, not just a single space up. So, so say you know X Core Space X could contribute to the next ten space ups, or at least maybe the space ups in 2016. And that's actually where the the foundation idea started. Is the very first space up one of our sponsors? came up to me and said, well, you know, it was good. We could throw in, you know, this for each space up. But what we'd really like is to just write one check mm -hmm. to a central organization and have them dole it out. So that's where that came from. So this is the beginning of the kind of the space up foundation funding process. And from here, you should be able to continue and uh, keep this going, uh, hopefully for future space ups, so you can have more and more around the world. And actually, I say more and more around the world. Uh, Dutta, there's a map. Um, I, I'm going to say... Haha, segue. I'm going to segue into the map. Are these, what are we looking at here? Are these all the space ups that have occurred around the world? These are all the space ups that have occurred around the world. Yes, yeah, so there's 41 that have taken place in the, in the world. And you can see they've been pretty spread out between the US, Europe, India, and Australia, and New Zealand. And so we expect this to continue to grow with the help of the foundation. It's kind of the point is the foundation will enable additional space ups to actually get off the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And and space ups are doing well around the world and they're they're going to continue to happen whether the foundation exists or not. Mm. One of the things that we've noticed though is that in Europe they're doing very well because there's both a nonprofit partner and an organization Space Up Europe that are pushing those forward. And in the US, uh, they've had some trouble in the the past couple of years. And so there've actually only been four space ups in the past couple of years in the US. And so that's actually where we're concentrating uh, at least for the next couple of years is to bring the US back up to uh, to the rest of the world's speed. 
Maybe I should stop slacking and create uh, Space Up Orange County, make that actually happen. Although there is Space Up LA, which is like half an hour, <laughs> ah, half an hour in uh, uh, one direction. So, all right, um, uh, we, we talked about what you guys are doing. It, when is it, when is it going to launch, Chris? Because uh, I, I mentioned 5.15.15, and that was yesterday. So uh, what's the plan? That's so funny, yeah. So um, we actually got all of the things together. So there's there's quite a lot that goes into um, kind of ramping up to a, a good solid Kickstarter. You want to have a really great story. So we've actually, what we were just telling you about the rewards and, and where we're going to use it and where the money goes, um, we're, we've been telling that story over and over again. And we wrote it down and there's a video and that kind of thing. And all of that was basically driving toward the 15th in order to launch because it's got a five in it. And we got there and Jesse was actually sitting in the room with me and we it's went to hit the button to and it popped up with a little message that said, yes, Kickstarter will start approving this <laughs> project now. Start approving and we'll get to, you know, we'll get back to you at some point in the next few days, maybe a week. Hopefully. <laughs> so you're holding on Kickstarter at this point. Yeah, yeah. But actually, the, the whole thing is actually ready to go. And so um, it, the, the rewards are, are lined up, and the, the video is done, and the story is all together. So whenever they give us the approval, we're going to hit the button and, and start it. Now, so. This is not your first Kickstarter campaign. So I'd like to transition this a little bit. So that's, that's what you've got going on right now. Very soon, I assume, it will be approved within the next few days. Of course, it's in Kickstarter's court, so we don't really know, but probably pretty soon. Uh, but you, you ran into a gotcha. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of big advocates of uh, creating citizen space and, and kind of going out there and do, just doing stuff in space. And Kickstarter is a great way to help fund that stuff. And Chris, you wrote a great article called How to Ruin a Kickstarter, talking about uh, different things that Kickstarter campaigns do wrong. So what I'd like to do is talk about um, if, if, someone, if someone in the community of tomorrow has an idea for a Kickstarter, what are some of the things they should consider to do right? And what are the, some of the things they should avoid doing wrong? So either one of you can, I, I know Chris, you wrote the article, but you've both done these campaigns before and, and kind of know some of those gotchas. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just, you know, I can briefly summarize, you know, the point in the article, because it was actually something that I wrote after seeing a bunch of Kickstarters and Indiegogo campaigns, similar sorts of campaigns for big space, you know, projects. And, and, and I say projects really loosely because what they were is, we're going to send something to the moon. And, you know, we were, we're raising $50,000. And you look at that, and on the face of it, it just doesn't make any sense. And then, okay, well, what do I get back from this? Do I send something to the moon? Do I get something back from the moon? And what you get is our thanks and a T-shirt. And it's like, well, it doesn't really match up. So the, the basic principles that you start with are first, start doing the thing. So, you know, for instance, we're doing this, you know, Space Up Kickstarter. We've both put on Space Ups before, yeah. and we know exactly how that goes. And we've actually been working for two years on this foundation. And so we've been doing the thing. So that's great. You can point to that. The second thing is make sure that the, the campaign itself is for a very narrow and well-defined piece of it. So the, the example I give in the article is if you've got an art car and you send it to Burning Man, and you need some money for better seats so that people don't burn themselves, then you, the Kickstarter should be about the seats, and it should be about people getting to use the seats or the car or whatever. So the, the, the rewards and what you're doing are very you know, tightly, tightly matched. Um, if you look at what uh, the, uh, the ARCID uh, Space Telescope uh, Kickstarter looked like for planetary resources, what you got out of that is your picture displayed on the telescope itself in space. That's awesome. That's awesome, and it's directly related to what they're doing, which is putting a telescope in space. Um, it's not fund our company for the next 10 years. It's not we want to go mine asteroids, which is the long-term view. It's we're putting a single telescope in space. This is how much we need to do that. So make it very specific. So let's give some uh, space geeks some ideas out there as to what work in space. You mentioned actually the example of, hey, we want to go to the moon for $50,000. If you go to Kickstarter right now and search for space, you'll find the polar opposite of that. You will find a, <laughs> let's start a space program for $60 million and like no information about it whatsoever. Ready, go. And it's got like $200. Uh, 
So uh, that obviously is also a mistake. So right. what are some of the things that uh, the citizens of tomorrow could do for Kickstarter for space? Do we have any ideas we can give them? I'm like, hey, here's something that if you wanted to do, go run with it. Right. I was actually uh, seeing a couple in the chat uh, today that were very interesting. People talking about, you know, small scale launchers. Um, there's actually a really good Kickstarter out there right now, which is for a 3D printed a rocket engine. Mm -hmm. And it's not we, we want to someday make a 3D printed rocket engine. It's we've designed one and what we need are the costs to actually produce it and fly it, which is that's great that you can you can point to what's real and what you've done already. You can talk about how without these funds, you can't make that thing happen. And then you can absolutely see where that would go in the future. It's like three printed rocket engines are an amazing leap forward. So it could be, um, I think CubeSats are a really interesting uh, thing to build right now because it, it's the sort of thing that's expensive for an individual. You know, you're, you're gonna you know, spend maybe $200,000, $300,000 to, to put a CubeSat together. But if you look at a Kickstarter, that's actually very reasonable. And so if you have a group of people who can get together and build something interesting, I mean, there, there are whole companies now based around, you know, pretty much cell phone technology and little cameras and a CubeSat that then they're selling imagery and that kind of thing. Uh, build out a proof of concept if that's something that's interesting to you and then take that and say, oh, you know, if we only had a chunk of funds right now, we could then take this to the next level. So step one is to, to create something. The thing with Kickstarter is it doesn't have to be a physical thing either. It can be, it can be, uh, it can be a show like this. It could, be, it could be anything that you can dream of. But you, like you said, build, build a prototype or, or something of whatever that either physical or non-physical thing is. Uh, then you're going to post it to Kickstarter. And this is where I'll tell you, that we struggled because we use Patreon because we're a recurring thing. Uh, and, you know, we keep using Kickstarter as a, as a term, but I, I would say there are two different crowdfunding sources out there that are really big and popular that you want to look at. If you've got a one-time thing, a CubeSat, you use Kickstarter. If you've got a recurring thing, a weekly internet show about the space and cosmos, for example, you'll use Patreon because you need recurring revenue over and over and over again for each one of those shows that gets produced. If you're producing a CubeSat every single week or every single month, maybe you want to look at Patreon. But where we got stuck on Patreon was the rewards. Those are actually extremely easy and difficult at the same time, trying to figure out what you should do. What are some of the gotchas with those rewards? So, yeah, and, and we've had this conversation before. Uh, the, the thing about rewards is that the, the really effective rewards are um, access and intangibles. And so let's say the show idea. The, the show is, is something that I, I would love to see a Kickstarter for. So let's say you were going to do a space-themed game show, right? It's going to be on the Tomorrow Network. And so we know that Ben and Carrie Ann can do, and, and you know, Dada and, and, and crew can do shows. We, we know that. Uh, there's an idea for this new show, and maybe they've, you know, filmed something in, in one of the rooms as a, as a test. But... In order to do a pilot, you need, you know, say, space to do the show or, you know, people to do the show or that kind of thing. So there's some chunk of money. So what would the rewards for that be, uh, both for the, that first pilot and then ongoing? Well, uh, think about this show itself. Why do people actually want to be involved in the show? Um, is it because they want to watch the show? So maybe it's that you have uh, tickets to come see it live um, or um, the chance to watch it live as it's it's because... There are things that you're giving away right now, like this live show that we're on right now. But let's say for the game show, you, re you really wouldn't want to do that because of the way that's being filmed. But for a core group of backers, you might do that. So access to the thing as it's being filmed. Um, what was the other one? That, oh, and then access to the people who are involved in the show. Let's say you're going to bring on um, a special guest every single uh, show. And uh, that special guest can spend half an hour beforehand on a, you know, a Google Hangout or can make a, a short video that says, hey, you know, backer, this is, you know, somebody you find awesome, um, you know, hello. Just something simple like that that's directly related to the show. You're going to be doing these things anyway. 
um, for something like a, a, um, a TV show or a, like a, a scripted TV show or a, um, a movie, the script is actually a really great reward where every you know, show that you produce, there's the shooting script. And the minute the show airs, you send all the backers the script. I, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Technical drawings, the, the, the napkin drawings that you used when you were coming up with the concept. All of the stuff that tends to kind of pile up in a corner because it's part of how you make things. There are a whole groups of people who would back you who find that stuff fascinating and amazing. So extending that to other items, because you know, using movies and shows as an example, you've got all of those things. But you can do the same thing for something like a CubeSat or a physical thing that you're building. Uh, some mm -hmm. of those napkin drawings you can actually, uh, in the US you need to be a little bit more careful if you're building something like a rocket engine, you've got ITAR, but uh, you know, some of those napkin drawings you can, you can release, you can do, the, like you said, kind of the intangible things. And I, I think one key takeaway, at least for us, was something that doesn't cost a lot of money because that comes out of your revenue stream. And that revenue stream you need to put into the thing that you're building. So t-shirts are actually bad. Uh, or can be bad because they can get expensive, uh, especially if you have low quantities, as can some of these other rewards. Uh, have you encountered that at all before or is it, have you not ever run into those problems because you, you do some of more of the intangibles? Oh, it, yeah, that's actually a big problem. So that's one of the reasons why we're not doing any physical items um, until we reach the stretch goals. Because, you know, let's say you've got something like a sticker, okay? Seems really simple. You design a sticker, you print a sticker, you can get them for 50 bucks off of uh, uh, something like Sticker Mule, and you get a bunch of stickers. That's great. But now you have, you know, let's say 500 backers who each one has their own address. They're all in various places around the world. And let's say about 10% of those addresses are going to have some kind of problem. So you have to stuff envelopes, you have to get those things to people. The actual you know, cost of, of mailing something is uh, considerable. So that's the thing is, as soon as it becomes a physical item, you've got to shift it around in space. You mentioned t-shirts. Uh, t-shirts are at the very high end of the scale because in order to produce a bunch of t-shirts, you need to know everybody's size of the t-shirt. Um, you need to do a lot of specific things in terms of um, uh, the, the design of the thing and, and, and printing it and that kind of thing. And then shipping a t-shirt, it's just big enough that it requires kind of a weird package, um, but small enough that it, it should be light. And so you end up spending, you know, three, four, five dollars just to ship each one of these t-shirts. And if you're, you know, let's say giving somebody a t-shirt at the $10 level, uh, you've just eaten up everything that they gave you to send them this unrelated thing. Yeah, th this is why I think rewards are important because people want them. They want that kind of access. But you have to be super careful that you don't absorb all your funds or s screw up your campaign with the rewards. And if you go and you read some of the, uh, the Kickstarter stories from people who have done these campaigns, even ones that have gotten millions of dollars, they talk about, yeah, we did not get as much as we thought we were going to get when it was all said and done. So, yeah, that's, that's where rewards become scary and important. Are there any other gotchas or things people should know when creating their Kickstarter for their awesome new spacey thing that they want to do? Yeah, there, there are a couple of other things to, to keep in mind. Um, one is time. Uh, it, it's, uh, it comes up as you're uh, producing the project. So if you're not thinking about it beforehand, it can, it can get in the way. Uh, there are the things that take longer than you think. So, like getting approval, which uh, I, I should have known because it happened to me the first time. But then after that, I, I had pre approval on my other account. Uh, so getting approval for the, the project, uh, putting together all the materials for the project, getting you know, video. Your, your video put together, yes. Uh, but then actually, um, there's this idea that it's like, OK, well, we'll run the project until we need the money. And then when it funds, we'll get this big chunk of money. Well, you don't get the money. At, uh, right away. What you do is you get, you know, hey, you've got money now and it's it's on its way and it could take a month to get there. So for instance, let's say you're putting on an event and you're going to you know, run a Kickstarter to fund it and the Kickstarter ends, let's say, two, three weeks before your event, you might not get the money until your event's passed. So you, you need to keep track of, of the time that's uh, that's involved. At the same time, 
it's also barreling along like a freight train. So um, the the second Kickstarter that I did for a space up, it was actually the second space up in uh, in San Diego. I went ahead and I just started it and started filling it out. And I had given a kind of an end point to it because of all those other timings that I was talking about. And the problem was that I wasn't telling anybody that it was out there. I wasn't, you know, spreading the world at, word at all. And so, of course, it just sat there languishing with the few people who had heard about it for, I think it was like a week and a half until I finally you know, got to the point where I said, OK, I can get my head you know, above water and wow, I should let people know. So leading up to the, uh, the Kickstarter with a bunch of, Hey, it's coming, you know, as it's coming, can you please let people know? Mm -hmm. And just kind of building a little bit of, of interest in it first, uh, is, can make a big difference once it actually starts. Now this campaign, we did a pre campaign. Yes. A social media campaign to get the word out. Did it work? The 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 pre I mean, it sounds like marketing these campaigns is a is a pretty big deal. Did the pre media campaign work for you guys? Or well, I mean, I guess you don't really know yet. But uh, have you gotten some of the interest you're expecting? Well, we got quite a bit of a, a response for it, and then once the Kickstarter actually goes live, then those people are going to help us become part of the people that spread the word uh, for the main campaign itself. So, in a sense, yes, it did. It did generate some pre-interest, and I think that it'll be a, a great addition to the to the audience. From the chat room of tomorrow, we uh, Spice Mac Sp <laughs> Space Mike asks, "Does showmanship matter for the Kickstarter video?" That is an excellent question, and I have no idea. Being a rather kind of haphazard and terrible showman uh, myself, uh, <laughs> but uh, I I've heard that showmanship doesn't really matter as long as you are honest about what you're doing and convey whatever passion it is that you have. And so if you're sitting there with the 3D printed rocket engine, I mean, picture Dave Mastin sitting on the set of tomorrow showing off the Zeus model. Showmanship doesn't enter into it. You can see in the just glee in his face yeah. that this is going to be an awesome thing. And I would throw money at the screen to make Zeus happen after seeing that. So I think that's much more important than putting together a slick video or, you know, making sure that all the right words are coming out or that kind of thing. Then again, that's me because I wouldn't be able to do that anyway. So it really comes down to the good story. I mean, like being able to tell a good story that that inspires everyone else to, to become part of it. Yeah. So um, my two takeaways are uh, be a good storyteller, no matter how you do it. Be Well, I guess it's more than two takeaways. Karen laugh at me for, for saying it was two and then it's more. Uh, be a good storyteller. Uh, be human, I think, is, is yes. kind of what you're saying, is, is be, be yourself. Don't try to be a salesman. Just be honest and truthful and human about it and show your passion for it. Uh, but then I think third, the third takeaway from all of that is we want to give Dave Mastin money so that he can go to the moon. Um, so if Dave is listening, <laughs> start a Kickstarter campaign. We will give you money to go to the moon. <laughs> we, we are excited about what you're doing. All right, um, a few more questions from the chat room. Uh, Mini Elon asks, uh, and this is kind of going back to the Space Up Foundation and Space Ups in general. Have you ever thought about making a Space Up at a launch event? Yes. Yes, I have, actually. Uh, that came up when I went to a launch for the Landsat mission, I think it was. Uh, they were launching from Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base, which isn't uh, far from where I live. And all those people together, and we were a, essentially a space up anyway, because whenever you get awesome space people in you know, the same place and they're, they're in a circle and they're chatting about things, that, that's really what it is. But it, it would have been great to have a little bit of structure because, you know, we were standing around before the launch and after the launch. And, you know, uh, I know that definitely for the, the shuttle launches, people were there for days and there were things like the endless barbecues. So I think that there's certainly an opportunity there. It would be a really weird space up because it's a space up where you know where it's going to be, but you're not really sure when it's going to be and it might shift by a week or a month, or more. Or may get interrupted. It might get launched. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, and that's the other thing is that, you know, at some point during your space up, a, a rocket's going to go up. And so, you know, maybe you know exactly to the second when that's going to happen, but maybe at the same time, you it, it might be one of those where you're not really sure. So I think 
there's an opportunity there, I would love to go to one and see how it works. You could also end up having that space up five times in a row <laughs> while you're waiting for it to, to launch off the pad. Um, Not a bad thing. You no, know, yeah, that could be. That could be actually could be. Uh, it's it, it's it's one pod, but five different times as opposed to five yes. different pods at the same time. Um, yes. Tawicket asks, uh, space ups are supposed to be recurring. Why not go with Patreon? Uh, although, are they supposed to be recurring? I, I guess I question that fundamental part of it. But there's the question from yeah. Tawicket. There, I mean, for any given space up. So let's say you know, space up Los Angeles. Um, you know. Uh, or San Diego, for instance, um, I, I go to one and then the first thing that I think of when it's done is when's the next one. And it's yeah. usually about a, a year away. Um, they're a year apart, though, uh, for a, a given place. And so that would be a rough one to do on Patreon because you, it, you'd have to sustain the effort. There, there's a version of that that I'd actually like to do with the, the foundation if we get a chance, which is... People who want to support the space ups wherever they are and are willing to give a little bit per space up in each place. And again, the, the problem there is what are what's their reward for that? What are they getting? Um, I, I get that just because I want to see space ups happen. But is it that you get the, the group photo from that space up? Is it that you get to see T minus five videos? I, I'm not really sure where that that comes in. All right. I think that uh, that wraps it up for the, some of the space up and the Kickstarter stuff. Uh, for those who don't know, Chris is also one of the um, main guys who helps our Reddit channel. So um, uh, what I think would be cool is, and Chris shouldn't have to necessarily run this, but he'll be there because he knows our Reddit uh, community quite well, uh, as does Jesse. I, you, you know, I, everyone does. Uh, if you guys have, in the community of tomorrow, have ideas as to what you think a space Kickstarter should be, like you've got an interesting idea, or you've got an unflushed out idea, and you want to start trying to do some of this stuff, we can use the Reddit, the subreddit of tomorrow to kind of help flush this stuff out before you start to try to make a Kickstarter campaign on your own, and use the power of the community to actually come up with something that may be successful and do some more cool awesomeness in space. It doesn't cost you anything other than a little bit of time. So if we want to use that subreddit as kind of a repository of, of different ideas for Kickstarter campaigns, I know Chris will be there, I'm pretty sure Jesse will be there, I'll definitely be there. Uh, so I think that's an interesting, interesting place and idea to do some of these things, because I'd love to see more stuff happening in space. All right, I think that's about it for this particular interview. Thank you guys. So I, Chris, we bring you on like every third week. Uh, so thank <laughs> you for taking time out of your weekend. And Jesse, it was good to see you again. Uh, you, were you away for a while or am I, am I just crazy? Yeah, I was gone to South America for a year. Oh, that's why. So uh, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, and uh, uh, best of luck on the campaign. I know we'll be supporting it. Hopefully the rest of the Citizens of Tomorrow will be supporting it as well. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Space News. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or for a little fashion lies. Films on some expectations. This girl's a fascination And nothing in her way Will keep her from her destination Cause she's firewalking She's firewalking When it's hot she keeps on moving But he keeps on improving Yeah, she's firewalking She's firewalking To be free And welcome back to Tomorrow I'm joined now by my beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham. And now before we get into space news, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow. See, I said I'd shout, so I shouted. Good These job. are the people who've contributed at least $5 or more <laughs> to this specific episode. <laughs> you can find, if you'd like to help crowdfund this show, uh, I don't know why, uh, you can do that over at patreon.com slash TMRO. Now we're gonna be bringing Space Mike in for the news segment. And uh, uh, I bring that up because he is our ambassador of space pods. And if you enjoy those space pods, we've got Ariel uh, doing uh, some of the hacker space kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had a, a great post on uh, the giggle factor of Uranus. 
Yes. Uh, uh, which was h hilarious and giggly. Uh, we've got Space <laughs> Mike doing uh, the news and the commentary and the events that are happening and some of the history of space flight. Uh, we've got Lisa. She is doing, uh, in, in her uh, awesome accent, she's doing uh, um, uh, stuff on, like, the science on the ISS. And then we've got Jared doing astronomy. Um, so we have five space pods per week. And if you'd like to help crowdfund those, you can go to patreon.com slash space pod. Now everyone's going, get to the news! So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, first off, Proton. Um, yeah. So here's the launch footage. Uh, now, one of two things. Either the microphone was about 10 miles away, because you will, in fact, hear those engines fire, or it was an IP-based microphone and it had some uh, delay in the stream. I'm not sure which, but give it a moment. Give it a moment. Anytime now. Actually, I think it's when the uh, graphic pops up. There we go. Now we should start to hear it. I'm sick of waiting. So uh, that launched on May 16, 2015 at 547 Coordinated Universal Time. That was an internet. There it is. There it is. <laughs> That's an international launch services. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, wow. those microphones were really far away. Yeah, really far away. International Launch Services uh, uh, Proton rocket. It was carrying MechSat-1, which is Mexico's $1.6 billion space-based communication. Well, it's the whole network, but that was one of the satellites for uh, that network. Uh, however, about eight minutes or eight and a half minutes into launch, uh, Roscosmos said there was an emergency situation, and that's pretty much all they said at that point. Uh, we did la la bleh, later learn that there was an issue with the third stage. This is going to be an interesting news segment. Third stage, <laughs> and um, uh, they did lose the payload. The rocket most likely fell back uh, to Earth from an altitude of about 160 kilometers. Most of that should have burned back up in the atmosphere, but any larger debris that would have survived that uh, would have fallen somewhere around, I believe that's pronounced Cheetah, which is Chita? Cheetah, I don't know. Uh, it's a city uh, in Siberia near Russia's southern border. Um, ironically, this crash happened exactly one year to the day from the last Proton launch issue so that they had. Russia hasn't been having a super great time recently, uh, so they've been having quite a few issues with their vehicles. Specifically, in the last six years, they've had 13 complete failures res resulting in the loss of all payloads. They've had three partial failures that left the spacecraft in the wrong or unrecoverable orbit, and they've had a complete loss of 20 spacecraft in, 20. Six, in six years. 20 spacecraft in six years! So, um, hopefully they're able to figure out, uh, I don't know if it's a QA issue, I don't know what the problem is, but hopefully they're able to figure out what's going on and fix that because this is impacting other things like ISS operations, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So, uh, that's the state of Roscosmos. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's what's going on. That's what happened with the Proton launch. And uh, on slightly better news, let's hand it on over to Space Mike to talk uh, some certification. It sounds boring, but it'll be cool, I promise. <laughs> so SpaceX has uh, just gotten certification to launch medium-risk satellites for now. Now, Space are uh, the low risk satellites for NASA because you might think about it and it's like, wait a minute, hasn't SpaceX already launched at least one or two? Uh, one I can think of was back on the Falcon 1, although that was a failure. But anyway, the whole thing with this certification is that with this certification, SpaceX will be able to start launching missions that, you know, are kind of in the higher price range and, you know, a lot of stuff for Earth observation and uh, satellites like that for NASA. Uh, specifically, coming up, uh, SpaceX is going to be launching the Jason 3 oceanography satellite for NASA. And that is also uh, in, in partnership with the European Space Agency. And so that's going to be coming from uh, um, Tails of Linea Space. Um, and that's going to be launching in July. Now, with that, um, they didn't have the certification until just just this week to actually be able to launch that satellite. So with that, that's going to open up a whole bunch of possibilities for science missions that SpaceX will be able to launch for NASA. They're still in the process of certification for launching military satellites and classified payloads for the military, the, the United States military, and that's an ongoing thing. There's a whole dramatic story if you guys are interested in getting into that. 
But um, as far as this goes, um, this opens up a lot of, of possibilities for what not only SpaceX can do, but what NASA can do as well, because the only other vehicles that were in this same classification were the Atlas V, the Delta II, Delta IV, and Orbital Sciences, um, now Orbital ATK's Pegasus rocket. So that's going to open up a lot of different possibilities, and it'll be inter interesting to see what other missions SpaceX is going to be launching other than Jason 3. The only one that I know about right now is they're going to be launching a uh, telescope, a space telescope in 2017 that's going to be looking for exoplanets around other stars, and it's going to be using the transit method of discovery. So that's pretty cool, but there's probably going to be a lot more in the future. Future. So anyway, I'm going to hand it back over to you guys because Carrie Ann has some very interesting news about the space station flights. Before we do the space station flights, you, you saw the uh, the quick little snippet of the uh, SpaceX graphics. Uh, I did want to show those really quickly one more time. These are some awesome SpaceX graphics that they have released on their Flickr channel. Uh, and Flickr feed, Flickr channel, Flickr page, uh, Flickr page. thing. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, they are at scary high resolutions, and I thought that they just looked absolutely gorgeous. And you can download those for free and turn them into whatever you want. I just thought that they looked really cool, and I thought you should share. You mentioned something about these as well. Uh, that they're all subtly branded. Oh, yeah, there's some really super subtle branding. So if you don't like SpaceX, maybe don't download them. Um, but yeah, they're like at crazy, scary resolution, so you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. They're under Creative Commons uh, on their Flickr feed, which is really kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, really, really, it's almost like a, a hidden Mickey. Hidden, a hidden will. SpaceX. Hidden uh -huh. SpaceX. All right, <laughs> moving right along. Uh, so Sarah Brightman, for those of you who don't know, is a singer. She's a soprano. Uh, she's done some sort of crossover stuff. Uh, they call it orchestral pop, that sort of thing. What uh, does that mean? But so, but she has intended. She's actually had a lifelong dream of going uh, into space in the International Space Station. I guess not her entire life, but wanted to go into space, and uh, was intending to go to the International Space Station to be the uh, to be the first professional musician to perform in orbit because we've had other performances in orbit. Uh, and sadly, she's had to put those plans on delay. Was she, was she, was that uh, who, who he sang? Um, Chris Hadfield. Hadfield, is she, is she harping on Hadfield? No, she just gets paid to be a performer and he gets paid to be an astronaut. All right, anyhow, yeah. Okay, I mean, I think that's the definition of professional musician, is it not? I guess. Okay, not too. Anyway, so, so she's had to put, her, sadly, she's had to put her plans uh, um, on delay. She was supposed to launch September 1st of this year. This has nothing to do with the uh, proton failure or progress issues or anything along those lines. Uh, this is actually for personal family reasons, which is a little bit unfortunate. She has trained, uh, she's had some NASA training. She was training at the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. She's done the uh, outdoor survival training and what have you. So she really was all set to go, and it's kind of unfortunate that she's had had to, to put her plans on delay but so it's sad but it's kind of neat that it's uh, she's very open about it and everything that's going on and that's very cool it's kind of you know. now as you mentioned the reason that she didn't do that was because of the uh progress failure yeah and um i get all the depressing russian news today do, apparently. apparently uh so there's that progress supply ship that spun out of control on april 28th mm -hmm. uh that happened most likely because of the upper state there was likely an upper stage issue and they were unable to recover the progress so they lost over a ton of supplies to the International Space Station. Um, because of that, Russia is delaying the return of three International Space Station crew astronauts back down to Earth. Uh, they're doing that by about a month or so, mm -hmm. so that they have time to kind of analyze what was going on before they then spin up a new progress vehicle. Now, they're kind of playing um, musical chairs with all of the different uh, uh, the vehicles at this point. Uh, they're going to accelerate the processing of another progress ship, moving the launch of M28M or uh, 60P to from August 6th to early July. Uh, then they're going to take the, um, the landing and they're going to delay that. And then there's a launch of three new uh, astronauts. They're going to push that back as well so that that will happen after the progress vehicle. So... Uh, we're, we're kind of moving the progress supply craft in front of the crew stuff right. and then moving the crew stuff behind that so that they can try to figure all of that out. Right. Um, yeah, like I said, it's just going to give them time to investigate a little bit more, figure out what's going on with the vehicle. And um, 
Yeah, they just didn't, really what it comes down to is they didn't want to leave the station with just three crew. Kind of an interesting time we live in. Yeah. I remember not that long ago. So you're looking at footage, uh, actually, from a Soyuz craft of the International Space Station with shuttle attached. Back when shuttle uh, and Soyuz were helping to build the station, mm -hmm. we really never had more than, for the most part, we generally didn't have more than three people on board per permanently, mm -hmm. unless you had a visiting craft like shuttle. Uh, and now we're at a point where... We don't want less than six because we have so many experiments going on right. that they don't want to. They don't want to understaff uh, the space station. That's kind of a cool, cool problem to have. Yeah, it it is. sucks that we have the issue that we don't have another vehicle capable of sending humans up there today. Uh, but maybe we'll uh, we'll have that in the not too distant future. So there you go. Um, hopefully that'll be fixed out soon. Only a month long delay. Hopefully, but right. we're looking at about a month, and then we'll have uh, full operations back to sta station for human spaceflight at least uh, ready to go. Right. Um, and for getting additional vehicles to the International Space Station, we look to Commercial Crew, and I'll hand that over to Mike to talk about uh, how that's looking. Mike? Well, the uh, budget request for uh, NASA's budget next year, first of all, has been submitted already by the, uh, the President's office, and it has been being deliberated in Congress as we speak. And the Subcommittee for Science has released a budget that is the same amount as what the President has requested, but in different percentages for different programs. Originally, for Commercial Crew, the President had asked for roughly $1.2 billion for the Commercial pr Crew program. And this Subcommittee for for, uh, and this is in Congress, uh, keep in mind, that they're wanting to only give a billion dollars to the commercial crew program, which is about 20% less than what the president has asked for. And even though it is, you know, a cut, this is not as much of a cut as they have done in years past. Some of that money is going instead towards the SL uh, Space Launch System program, and they're moving things around in the science program, they haven't specified what in, in this budget request. They haven't specified whether there's going to be more money towards the James Webb Telescope or if the Earth sciences are going to be slashed to move things around. So it's not exactly clear on what their plans are for that. But at least for commercial crew, if this gets passed, and it hasn't been passed yet, it still has to go on to the full science committee, and you know Congress has to approve this and, and finish voting on it. They haven't finished voting on it yet. And then it needs to pass over to the Senate. They have to approve it, and back and forth between these uh, three branches of government before this budget for next year is finalized. And so this is subject to change, but if this happens, it will slow down the progress on the commercial crew program, and the United States government is just going to have to give more money to the Russians with all of their problems that they're having to launch our astronauts on the Soyuz capsules. And it's been really reliable, but its rockets haven't been lately. So a very scary situation, and hopefully Congress will be able to get their act together. And if you guys are so inclined, then please Contact, contact my local rep representatives frequently to tell them what I think they should be doing. It doesn't amount for too much, but if enough people get involved with that, we can't actually make a difference if they know what their constituents actually want. So please get involved with that, please. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say on the subject for now. <laughs> all right, awesome. Thanks, Space Bank. Now, before we go to break, uh, Mike, do you have a, a rough idea as to what space pods we can expect next week? For next week, um, I'm possibly going to be doing another uh, space plane history pod, um, depending on what the news comes and goes. I'm always kind of in, you know, kind of standby mode until the last minute to see if there's something uh, um, in the news that I want to talk about that's something to issue. Something else that I want to get around to is uh, all the different small business uh, in innovation research uh, grants that Na NASA has dueled out. There are a lot of really cool concepts and cool ideas that are building on progress of a lot of these small businesses that they've already been doing. So a lot of these ideas and hardware are actually feasible and being built right now. So there's a lot of really cool stuff, but there are over 350 proposals. And there's right now I have about 20 of them that I really want to talk about. So that's kind of a big thing to talk about for uh, space pods. But um, Jared Head is going to be continuing his um, uh, four-part series on the differences between different telescopes and what you should be looking for for that. So
Zanofsky's uh, um, space pod, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to be, but I can say for sure that it's going to be about some sort of experiment on the International Space Station. And um, that's all that I know for now, so that's what we can uh, look forward to for next week. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, let's give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $2.50 or more to the specific episode. These are Patreon Plus subscribers, and they are going to also get a copy of After Dark as soon as it is available on demand. It's usually around the same time as this show goes live, maybe a day or two later, mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like to get After Dark. Otherwise, it takes about four weeks for it to actually make it out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, but there's more. We also have our Patreon subscribers. These are the people who've contributed one penny to this specific episode, one penny or more, one penny to two dollars and forty-nine cents, and uh, there, for that amount, you get your name in the show and a couple other really cool perks. So even a penny helps to crowdfund this show. For more information, you can head over to Patreon.com/tmro. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some comments from last week's show. First up. No, oh, I'm digging all of it. First up comes from Hi Will Davis or Hi Will uh, 95 on Twitter. Says it's crazy how far at TMRO has gone in the two thirds years I follow them. Is it two thirds years or two out of three years? Two, I think it's two, two to three. Two, two to three years. Two to three years I follow them. Okay. In two thirds of a year we've done nothing, so I have to believe it's two to three that's, years. That's pretty true. Yeah. Actually, uh, feeling great. Feeling great supporting a great show and Space Pods. Yeah, actually, uh, Space Mike, our admiral <laughs> of Space Pods, has been doing a fantastic job of actually. Um, um, you know, curating those and making those happen and mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, they're posted on a fairly timely manner because I'll travel around the country and, like, I, I just, I, I don't even... I don't even, know, they just happen. They just magically happen, and that's because of Space Mike. Which is so awesome. let's be clear on that. Uh, so that, that's great, and, and he's been a fantastic help for that, and so a huge thank you to Space Mike. Uh, if you want to see an even bigger transition, go back to Season 1. That's fun. So, oh, go back to season one, episode one. I shouldn't even bring that up. Go back to season one, episode two, when she was like, you're terrible by yourself. Let me help you. Uh, yeah, you can see you can see us because we, we, you know, we lay it out there and we keep them all online. So you can see us uh, transition and improve over the years. Except for this show. Online. Except for this show, which even ironically, his mic is breaking up when he's trying to talk. That's so awesome. All right, let's moving on. Uh, from U5KO. This one comes from U5KO also on Twitter. NASA's doing a mission to Euro uh, Europa. ESA's is doing a mission to, apparently <laughs> NASA's doing a mission, mission to Europe, Europe. And then Europe's doing a mission in, let's try that again. NASA's doing a mission to Europa. ESA's is doing a mission to Ganymede. I want to know which people which one people like more? All right, so leave your comments. I have my own opinion, but I'll, I'll tell you on the next show that we do, which may or may not be next week. I'm not sure yet. Uh, so I'll tell you my opinion on that particular matter, and um, 
Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll tell you that. I think that NASA time. should do a mission to Europe. We haven't been there a long time. <laughs> Sorry, into Europa. That's what that's Europa, what I was Europa, meaning right. to say. So uh, leave your comments Goodness. on Reddit, on YouTube, wherever you want, and uh, we'll kind of sum them up on uh, next week's show. And I'll, I'll let we you know. We have what a tally. We can just next, do show. at tomorrow hashtag Europa at tomorrow. Oh, that's a great idea. Gaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a little, do a little Twitter vote, right? So do a little Twitter yeah. vote. Just yeah, at tomorrow hashtag uh, or just hashtag tomorrow hashtag Europa hashtag right. tomorrow hashtag hashtag uh, hashtag. You got to do it Jimmy Fallon way. Yeah, Jimmy I don't. Fallon, okay. <laughs> Uh, hashtag uh, Ganymede, Ganymede, and uh, there you go. Uh, next up. Next one comes from YouTube. This is Nico's Mind. I love it when Daddy and other Daddy fight. <laughs> the mini debate was fun, and yes, let's have it, or throw in the odd debate episode once a month or something. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, between Space Mike and myself, where Space Mike was wrong and I was right. And um, <laughs> brilliantly, his microphone is muted right now, so he can do whatever he wants and we can't hear him. And uh, <laughs> Mostly it's a lot of this right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, but no, that was in relation to boosting the International Space Station, uh, so it'd have to change its inclination and its orbit and a bunch of other things using um, a fantastic amount of fuel. While technically possible, highly, highly unlikely likely due to the amount of resources it would take to actually make that happen. Assuming it could even survive such a lift. Uh, right. I mean, you're, you're moving it so much, it's basically it's basically like launching it from scratch again. Not quite, but pretty close. So the difference is you're not launching it as one component. Mm -hmm. You're launching it as the whole thing because it's still in Earth's gravity. So you have to push it out of its current inclination then push it over to L1. And that's just not a realistic thing. So there you go. Uh, and I'm giving no one the ability to counter. To, so, to debate that. To debate that. So okay, there you go. good. Uh, I actually did legitimately bring it back to some rocket scientists and they're like, yeah, no. So, all right, uh, finally. Uh, this one also comes from YouTube. This is from Alex Cantor. I think that Ben is right about testing near White Sands. All right, that's our show for this week. Wow. Thank you so <laughs> wow. <laughs> However. What? What? No. However, he missed one additional benefit. If something were to go wrong, you don't have to explain anything at, be <laughs> because it probably happens to the people out there all the time. Unlike having to explain why things are exploding in your backyard when your next door neighbor comes up to your all door. Right, Alex, here's the thing, though. Mojave, or Mojave, as we like to call it, is in the middle of nowhere. It is in the middle of the desert. The difference is there's a road that goes, there's like a highway, like a highway right. that goes through there. And um, due to some other road closures, there actually was a good amount of traffic, trucking traffic that was on that highway when the Spaceship Two problem happened. Right. And so uh, there was some stuff nearby that was going on, but otherwise... Um, yeah, it is kind of in the middle of nowhere. The advantage of Spaceport America is really that airspace. Uh, you've got, uh, it's basically Air Force airspace. So. I can quote the, uh, the PR piece that came out from Spaceport America, if you like. Oh, please, please. Saying. Uh, please. The advantages include a, an FAA licensed launch site with access to 6,000 square miles of restricted airspace through a collaboration with the U.S. Army White Sands Missile Range, a very low population density, 340 plus days of annual sunshine, low humidity, and the nearly mile high elevation and low altitude of its location. That the value nice. proposition is complete when combined with Spaceports America flexible fly uh, lease build offering, which enables commercial space companies to literally design their own spaceport supported by 24 7 security, EMT, and fire protection. That's a lot of moxie right there. So, so White Sands does, uh, or Spaceport America does have have a lot of advantages uh, when put in that particular context. Uh, For suborbital space flight, right? Yes. It, it kind of, it, it breaks down a little bit more when you want to do orbital and you have to pass over land in order to do stuff. So anyhow, right. that's that's uh, that's the thought process there. So I'm, I'm not sure that Mojave is that bad. I mean, it is in the middle of nowhere and it is kind of yeah. a testing ground for this stuff. When you it's talk about low population density, Mojave. Mojave wins. And if you don't believe us, go to Mojave. Yeah, that, I'll just leave it at that. All right, that's our show for this week. Thanks so much for watching. There may or may not be a show next week. Uh, check our YouTube channel for all of that. Um, and that will kind of dictate what's actually happening with that one. We have a potential scheduling conflict that may actually release itself. We don't actually know yet. However, for certain, the week after that, the very last show this month in, in May, there will be no show mm -hmm. that, that one. So we may not be on the air for two weeks in a row, or we may have a show. I don't know. Just watch our Twitter channel. Uh, or our live stream. If you subscribe to our live stream channel, uh, it'll alert you when we go live and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that'll let you know when we're actually uh, broadcasting. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching, taking time out of your Saturday to make this happen. If you're watching on demand, taking time out of your whatever day you're watching. And uh, we'll see you in a bit.